Well, tonight is our final session in our One Another series, and it's been my goal through this series uh, to not only to instruct you, but to inspire you. I want to inspire you to pursue what we've been uh, describing as personal and purposeful relationships. Personal relationships where um, someone knows you. Someone knows your fears, your weaknesses, your struggles. Someone knows how to pray for you on a, on a personal and spiritual level. Someone knows you well enough to keep you accountable, well enough to keep you motivated, well enough to keep you humble, and you know them in that way too. Purposeful relationships, personal and purposeful, purposeful because uh, because of this person in your life, you are closer to the Lord. You can go to this person with questions or struggles or problems, and they'll help you, um, and they'll give you hope, and they'll give you encouragement, and they'll equip you to, to face it, and you do the same for them. Um, well, we've been looking at these relationships and uh, what they should look like in the church as we live out the one another's. And over the course of these weeks, we've looked at how to listen to one another, how to point one another toward hope, how to bear one another's burdens, how to identify a spiritual need in another person, how to teach or admonish one another, how to encourage one another, how to pray for one another, and how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Well, we've been at this for 10 weeks. This is our 11th uh, week uh, on this topic. And well, let me ask you a question. Do you have someone in your life that fits that description uh, of a personal and purposeful relationship? Right? Do, Do you have someone in your life? If you do, I hope that this series has been helpful to you to identify and to clarify some of your interactions and the kind of things that you should be pursuing together. I hope it's instructed you and equipped you how to have deeper and more effective relationships. Let me ask again, do you have someone in your life that fits this description of a personal and purposeful friend? And if not, why not? You know, like, like all good things in life, it doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen without effort on your part. Don't wait for someone to come to you and just happen to ask you. Don't wait for um, someone to seek you out, but you go and seek someone out, someone of the same gender, right? And in fact, some of you might be sitting next to that person. They might be your spouse, and I think that that is wonderful, but I also think that we should have same-sex um, friendships in our life where we can talk about uh, um, issues and struggles that we face as men together and as women together. I definitely think that a married couple should be that kind of friend, but I also think that there's benefit in having those relationships outside of marriage. But go seek someone out and share some personal bit of information about yourself and see how they respond. See if they respond in kind. If they don't, move on to somebody else, right? If someone comes to you, recognize the effort that they're putting forth and respond in such a way as you would want them to respond to you. Now, remember that these relationships are not about shared interests or common traits. This isn't about age or life stages or hobbies or family dynamics, right? Those things don't have to factor in. But these are about mutual uh, uh, benefit and growth in the Lord. This is about our unity in Christ as brothers and sisters. Now, it could be that you've tried this in the past. Maybe you've had a relationship that was personal and purposeful for a while, but then it fizzled out. Well, okay, all right. Remember, remember two things. You at that time, we're in relationship with a sinner, okay? And you're a sinner too. So, hey, that kind of thing's going to happen, right? 
In fact, this kind of relationship, it takes work, and it's not always comfortable. Sometimes in our flesh, we're happy to let a relationship fade away instead of continuing in the hard and uncomfortable work of heart surgery on a regular basis. And in our sinful flesh, we're more than happy to let it fade away. You know what? Here's what you need to do. Give that person grace and give yourself grace and start it up again. Or don't. Sometimes relationships are just for a time, just for a specific season in life or just to get you through a certain circumstance in life. Think about Paul and Barnabas. They had a great partnership together until they parted ways, right? And I think that God was in that because it's divide and conquer, right? Uh, Paul went with Timothy, and Paul went with Silas, and then eventually Timothy, right? And Barnabas took John Mark, and he went off, and they uh, divided, and they, and they were able to accomplish more. Perhaps that relationship that you had was just for a time, and now it's time to move on, and that's okay too. But like I said, in the, other, in the, in the first example, give yourself grace. Give them grace and say, hey, let's give it a go again. I think there's benefit in it. Well, whichever the case, I hope to inspire you to pursue personal and purposeful relationships. And um, we have some resources for you. We, we have some framework. Maybe you don't know how to do it. Like, what would that even look like? If we're not talking about the game or the hobbies or the weather or family life or whatever's in the news or something, like, what would that even look like? We have some framework that we can provide for you to, to help guide some of those conversations until it just becomes a natural thing. Well, like I said, I hope to inspire you to do that. I think the summer would be a great time, especially as we take a break on these Wednesday nights for these couple months before we come back in September. It'd be a great time to start and say, hey, let's get together over the phone. Let's get together for coffee, for breakfast. Let's, get, let's go on a walk. Let's whatever. Let's spend some time uh, together in a per- personal and purposeful way. All right, well, now let's get on to our final one another that we're going to look at tonight. And uh, the title of this one is Speak the Truth to One Another. I hope you got a page when you uh, came in here. Uh, it was handed out. Now, this comes from several texts in the Bible. And uh, let me just read these uh, for you. Um, uh, four of them are found in Ephesians, and then one of them in Romans. Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead, um, now the context of this is to avoid immaturity and to avoid deceptive teaching, and so instead, be speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. Just a few verses later, we're, we're told... Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, right? For we're all bodies, uh, members of one body. Again, just a few verses later, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And then in the following chapter, uh, again, the context here is about being filled with the Spirit So as you are filled with the Spirit, you will be speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And then Romans 15, this comes at the end of his letter to um, uh, uh, the believers in the city of Rome, and the context is that he's kind of summing up what he's done here right before his uh, final personal greetings. You know, Paul has written to remind them This is what he says, I have written, this is the reason I've written to you to remind you of the things that you already know, namely the gospel, but he did so boldly. And then he says, but I am convinced, I am myself convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. And so this carries with it the idea of speaking truth to one another one another. Well, as we consider these verses, we see two conditions regarding our speech, or two um, uh, ways that we can frame this. And and the first one I'd like to look at is how. How are we to go about speaking uh, to each other? And uh, the first one that we come across 
is that we should speak in love. We should speak in love. One of our verses there, the first one, it says, speaking the truth in love. Now, there's a lot of jokes around this one. You know, you don't just get to say something completely harsh and in your face and, you know, and, and, and then just tack in love, you know, on the end of it. You don't get to, no, no, it doesn't work like that, right? So, so what does that mean? Well, for us to understand and really grasp what this idea of speaking the truth in love means, we have to be reminded of the definition of love. So you see there on your page, love is willing self-sacrifice for the spiritual good of another. Willing self-sacrifice for the spiritual good of another. Well, what does this exactly mean? What, what, what does it mean that we should be doing this for the good of another? Well, <clears throat> some other verses can kind of clue us in on this. The one from uh, Ephesians 4.29, right? It says that we should only be speaking what is helpful for building others up, right? So uh, that it may benefit those who listen. So to do for their good means that, uh, that it may benefit those who listen, that it might be for their benefit, that it might be for their good, that it might be for their growth. Um, one author said it this way, and this is stuck with me. He said, in, in summary of this Ephesians 4.29 verse, if what you are about to say can't be received as a gift, don't say it. If what you are about to say cannot be received as a gift, boy, think about that, right? Think about the conversations that you've had uh, already this week. Think about the conversations that you've had with that person sitting next to you this week. Did everything that came out of your mouth uh, this week, uh, could it be received as a gift to the other person? Well, I guess there's question whether or not it should have been said. Well, much of our communication is not so much what we say, but how we say it. Have you ever uh, had that kind of had that response given to you after you've said something? It wasn't what you said; it was how you said it. No, I'm sure I'm the only one. I'm sure I'm, there's no never it happened before, right? Um, it's not what you said; it's how you said it. Well. Much has to do with how things are said. And, and how we say something is, is generally determined by the condition of our hearts, right? So when we're considering our communication to one another, we should be, uh, we should be looking to the interests of others. And so you look in the back page there of your uh, sheet, and it says... Uh, not what is in your own interest. Not what is in your own interest. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 remind us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of others. And that word interest also carries with it the idea of to, to the benefit of, of others. So do nothing out of selfish ambition. Um, do nothing except for the words that you say. Is that, is that a clause in there? Is there a footnote in your scripture? No, I don't think so. I think that do nothing includes um, all of our speech as well. Uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But uh, look, look to the interests of others. So what that means is that, that your heart motivation when you are speaking to someone else is not about speaking your mind, speaking what's on your mind, right? It's not about, well, listen, I just got to say, right? I, I just got to say. That essentially, when you are saying that, you are declaring that the only thing motivating you in that moment is your own interests. And when you say, I just got to say, that means I don't, I don't care how this comes out. 
I don't care the audience, the circumstance, but I have to, I have to get this out. And that flies in the face of what we're commanded to do, right? Getting something off your chest is not necessary to someone else as the recipient is not proper motivation, is not proper heart condition when you uh, are speaking to someone else. Now, when you speak to the Lord in prayer, man, you can just got to say all day long. The Psalms are filled with just got to say's, right? How long, O oh Lord, will you forgive me forever? This is how I feel right now, okay? Or I got to get this off my chest, right? The enemies, they're all around me, all of this stress, this pressure. Great, okay, get that off your chest and give it to the Lord. You can just got to say to the Lord all day long. But when speaking to one another, when speaking to another brother or sister in Christ, consider their um, interests, consider what will be most beneficial for them, speak the truth in love, in love for their uh, spiritual and redemptive good. The third one, as we consider these, is uh, speak truthfully. Speak truthfully. Um, uh, this one comes, uh, again, from Ephesians uh, 4.25. We're told to put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Um, you know, we shouldn't be deceptive in our talk. This pretty much almost goes without saying. We should speak truthfully. But the question then comes up, what about when speaking truthfully is in conflict with this previous principle about speaking in love, right? Um, or, or speaking to their best interest. That, that what you're about to say, though it is truthful, wouldn't be uh, received as a gift. Well, what do you do then? Well, take some time to figure out how you can say it in such a way as to be helpful, as to be a gift. And if you can't figure out a way to say it, don't say it. And even if it's a direct question, you say, you know what? I just don't feel comfortable answering that question right now. You know, we live in such a highly verbose society. Everybody's talking, every, just everybody constantly just sharing whatever is on their mind. There is not enough time in the multiverse to consume all of the content that is being recorded. There just isn't. And we have we've lost sight of the instruction in God's Word that we should be slow to speak slow to speak. When someone answer, asks you a question, when you're confronted with a circumstance, and yes, it might be truthful, but you have not quite figured out or you haven't cultivated that relationship enough to, for, for what you're about to say to be received as a gift and in a loving way for their good, then just sit on it. Or take the time. Take the time. We do not want to be flippant with our words. We do not want to be haphazard with our words. James 3, 5 tells us, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And today, of, of all the days, this, this week with the fires from Canada and the smoke drifting over, you know, affecting millions of people, millions of people, it was started by a small spark, right? One, st one small spark started that forest fire, and now here's the effect. Let's keep that um, in perspective. Uh, you don't, don't let your tongue be the spark that starts a fire. And do not hide behind the, well, it's the truth. Uh, yeah, because we can't be out of balance here and just wave the truth flag. It's the truth in love. If we can't figure out a way to say it in love in the way that it would be received as a gift, then don't say it. Well, let's move on now to what should we say? What should we say? Well, before we get exactly there, let's talk about what we shouldn't say. What we shouldn't say, right? Um, and again, that's from Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk, or perhaps your version would say corrupt communication, 
right? Either unwholesome or corrupting communication. So no unwholesome talk, no corrupt talk. And it doesn't say try, try not to let. It says do not let any, any. There is no room for error there, any. So what is uh, corrupting communication or what is unwholesome talk? Well, that would be like gossip or judgmental talk. Oh, we live in a world of just easy judgmentalism. We're constantly just offering our opinions and our commentary on everybody, it's everything. Complaining. Complaining is unwholesome talk because your complaints are contagious and it'll affect their heart. Worrisome. Worrisome or faithless talk. You know, your worrying can be contagious to someone else. It can cause them to doubt. Unhelpful criticism. Again, some criticism can be okay, but unhelpful criticism. where you're, It's basically complaining. All right? I'm going to step on some toes here. Joking and sarcasm. Joking and sarcasm. Now, listen, in, in every friend group, there is always one who is the willing recipient of, you know, willing recipient to be the butt of jokes, you know, and they're, they're just the one that's picked on, and everybody knows that, and, and we've all come to accept that. But man, is that speaking life into that person? Or does it reinforce what we've all come to accept, that they're just the butt of jokes? I understand that there's a friendly camaraderie that comes with that. And to the point that everybody's laughing all the time, sure, maybe. But take into consideration that that person needs to put their head on the pillow at the end of the night, and they need to lay with their own thoughts and their own understanding of their identity. Have your words reinforced who they are in Christ, or who they could be in Christ? Or have your words reinforced that they're just the butt of jokes? And then lastly, uh, sarcasm. Um, you know, again, I think, I think sarcasm, man, it, that is... Uh, That's like, uh, that's like celebrating uh, 4th of July with sparklers uh, in, a, in a dry forest, you know? Maybe, maybe those embers will cool off by the time it hits the floor, uh, you know, and ignite those pine needles or whatever, but maybe not. I have seen, I have seen plenty of marriages ruined uh, with sarcasm because, you know, well, I'm just joking and they need to get over it or whatever. It is, uh, it can be harmful. So again, as long as everybody is laughing and everyone's a part of the joke, but if you're trying to communicate a serious, if you're trying to communicate truth in a sarcastic or, uh, you know, dropping hints in a joking manner, you're not being truthful. You're sending mixed messages and that's not speaking the truth and it's not speaking it in love. So if you're truly joking and it's just fun for everybody, great. But if that's your means of trying to communicate serious things or trying to uh, drop hints, that's neither truth nor in love. Okay. Um, certainly corrupting talk and unwholesome, might anything that might cause a brother or sister to sin, uh, chances are you are... Uh, sinning with sinful speech, uh, and, and therefore you are causing them to sin as well. Um, so we, when we answer the question, what should be the content? First of all, we say what it, what it shouldn't be. But then number two, I want to also mention, you know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid to say, I don't know. 
If the question comes up in your pursuit of purposeful, uh, personal and purposeful relationships, and there's some question, there's some topic, there's some issue that you don't have an answer to, don't just make something up. Don't resort to something that you heard, right? Don't just try and patch something together. Say, I, you know, I don't know. And then go ask another friend. Go ask a, a, a teacher or go ask a pastor. There are loads of good resources. Now, there are loads of garbage resources too. But there are loads of good resources that you can then reference and come back to. Um, number three, we are to speak the truth. We are to speak the truth. Now, not, not just that we are supposed to be truthful in that we are supposed to communicate things that correspond to reality and we shouldn't be deceptive, but I'm saying we should speak the truth, capital truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them, meaning set them apart and grow them closer to my image, right? Sanctify them, the process of maturing spiritually, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. And so, uh, God's word is truth. And w- when I say speak the truth, what I'm saying is that we need to be pointing people toward and we need to be speaking God's word to them. Some of you are like, yeah, I get it. Well, let me put a finer point on it. Resist the urge to speak good things to them, but speak God things to them, right? Don't just speak good words, speak God's words to them. Resist the urge to sort of revert back to, well, I've always been taught, because doggone it, chances are you've been taught wrong, or at least you remembered it wrong. I mean, half the time, half the time, we remember the stories and the illustrations or the outlines, and we don't remember God's Word. And that's what we end up passing on, is the illustration or the story or the whatever. Resist the urge to pass on popular psychology or Dr. Philisms, right, that we fill our heads with because they're all over the place. Don't just speak good words, speak God's words. And then lastly, we must know our Bibles. We must know our Bibles. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And of course, there could have been just so many other verses that could have gone in there showing that um, it is God's word that is truth, that sanctifies us, that is going to guide us um, along this path. Well, as I said earlier, I hope that I have instructed you on, to, on how to have um, you know, deeper personal relationships and effective purposeful relationships, but more so, I hope, that, I hope that I have inspired you to do so, that if you don't have someone, to, 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 to seek that person out. You might not know who it is, so go, go fishing. It's a little... It's a little like dating. It's kind of weird, to be honest. That's okay, right? You know, you, you, you got to kind of put yourself out there and be like, hey, how you doing? You want to get coffee? Let's talk about personal things. <laughs> That's a little odd. But here's the thing. Wow. Should it be odd? Should it be odd in God's family to talk about our relationship with Him, to talk about how we're, how we're um, applying God's Word to our life? to talk about the things that we struggle with, to talk about how we're growing in grace. Boy, let's make it, let's let's make it at least among us not weird anymore, right? Well, listen, if you have any questions or you want some help, like I said, I mentioned about how to, we have a framework to get you started, uh, questions to ask and things like that. We can more than, more than happy to share those resources with you to help you. Um, But with that, uh, we'll be done. And uh, let me, let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this instruction. Thank you that your word is a light uh, to our feet and a lamp for our path. 
probably the other way around. Um, and uh, Lord, thank you so much that, uh, that it can guide us, that it can instruct us uh, how to live, how to please you, how to grow in holiness and to better reflect Jesus Christ. And, and as we talked about today, how to communicate effectively and lovingly with one another. Help us to do so. Uh, Lord, help, help us that uh, our tongues would not be uh, sparks that light fires that affect and, and cause great, great damage. Keep us in your grace, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.